Lewis, welcome back to the Potential is Human podcast. After the first episode, that's always a pleasure. After the first episode, I'm sure that the listeners who have listened or watched have a lot which they might want to approach you with in terms of questions. So I'm going to ask you some today. Uh, One of the things that I am really intrigued by, and I guess most people currently alive, is death and some believe they know what happens after death. Some have no idea. You're the only man that I currently know who can say that he has died. And this might be a shock to those looking at you on the screen. And here you are. But in reading your book, you woke up in a freezer, right? You had literally been declared dead. Yeah. Can you tell us what that experience must have even been like? And what was it like to come back? Dying was blissful, amazing. It was the most extraordinary experience I've had in this lifetime. And of course, the minute of my my soul's release from the physical body-mind projection, it instantly realized what was happening because it's been doing it for billions of years. And so it was this excitement, this immediate excitement, the immediate recognition of the essence of self. And there's this the swirling tunnel type effect, like this acceleration through this tunnel as this light body, because you're no longer a physical, you're just form energy, energy in form, um, pretty much like a cigar. You know, a lit cigar, light, fully full of light, and there's this acceleration. You're very aware that you are a being. Um, and you go through this this tunnel, and there's this bridge type experience where you bridge over, and then there's this I'm home experience. Oh, and it feels like okay. I've, Immediately, I recognized I've just been gone for a few moments, even though a whole lifetime has just happened. Because mm. in the spirit world, there's no time, or well, time's not linear like in this world. And so there's this experience of, I've just returned from an experience, from an experiment, from a, from a field trip. And, and there's immediately the recognition of I'm home. And you get greeted by beings that are your soul family. Some of them are alive in this world. Um, and my younger sister had passed on 15 years before me. And so, um, immediately she was there just to greet me, just, a, just a, like a, a greeting and acknowledgement. And she whisked off again, belonging to a different soul group, completely different group. So it was just a recognition. Thank you. Goodbye. Straight back into the soul group. And the spirit world looks like these solar systems like you're looking at from as you're entering it looks like solar systems made up of billions of these spherical like structures which are soul groups of consisting of two and a half thousand souls and in there the in each cluster there's layers and each layer is a level of awake awakened awareness there's no such thing as soul age Every soul is born at the exact same moment in, in the illusionary mm. space time. So what they have is different levels of conscious awareness. And based on the levels of conscious awareness, they resonate in a frequency and in a color. So the, the dark indigo blues are the awakened ones. The bright yellows and reds are what we naturally term younger or mature souls. Or you know, as they become old souls, they move into the sort of greens and blues and browns and then the advanced souls become indigo and then the master souls are almost pitch black in in essence they look like a starry sky and at that frequency you literally when they when you're near those beings that you hear this the om almost like an om you know like a like a mm. chanting there's a frequency sound to them and yet they're individually wrapped energies of course, at a later stage, you recognize these are fractures of one mind. One dreamer is dreaming this whole thing up, aspects and fractures of himself. And it's those fractures, spirit beings, that then project into the physical realm and become bodies. But it's it's the most blissful experience. I mean, 
you've heard me say this before, if you imagine yourself staring at the most beautiful sunset or sunrise and, with, and you're with the person, the most beloved person in the world, you know, and you're at this, having this total experience of love in togetherness, and mm -hmm. you have this flavor of ice cream in your mouth and the full body orgasm happening at the same time. That's what it feels like to be there. It's just bliss. It's this yes. incredible state of peace and joyful awareness, be the, the joy of being. Um, I run out of words because it's impossible to describe. Mm -hmm. But if everybody knew what dying felt like, I think we'd have mass suicide in this world. Not that you should run out and do it, because if you commit suicide mm, before it's your time to go, you'll be right back and you'll experience it all over again. But, it, but dying is simply the most wonderful experience anyone will have. And that's why I've always wondered how the ego has managed to create the fear of death in human beings. Because it's mm. simply transitioning. It's, it's as if you, you, you know, before you incarnate, you plan this in such detail and you're in and out. It's like you dip into a swimming pool, you have a quick swim and you're out. That's what it feels like there. You know, so an incarnation, so an 80 year incarnation in this plane, in the spirit world, feels like you've been away for a couple of hours at best. There's no sadness, the, um... there's no fear, and there's no, there's no scarcity. There mm. is still a desire to know what we are and to truly know the very essence of our source at the various levels of conscious awa awareness, what we call soul stages, which is really just awakened stages. The young soul has no idea what it is and what created it and it has a desire to know we it's built into us the desire to know our source and mm. it's built into every human being because it, it's the, the the spirit projecting it has projected onto this plane simply to know itself through the experience of what it's not because we start to remember what we are when we realize what we're not we we learn through the negative default the dying is is blissful and of course then waking up realizing i had all of this consciousness to bring back mm. and and projected myself back into my my body my dead body in the morgue in the body bag um there was this moment of amnesia and the minute i was back into my body and of course my first experience was pitch darkness and i had the body bag that dense thick plastic over my face Jeez. And 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 there was a moment of fuck. <laughs> I hope they haven't been, yeah. Yeah. you know, because for a moment, for a, I'd say for a good five minutes, I was back into body mind disorientation. It was almost as if that memory was gone. But as soon as I calmed, the memory returned, and I realized I chose this, and therefore oh, I meant to get out of here. And. Um, and there was a little bit of a egoic, mm -hmm. damn it, you know, <laughs> I'm back in this body. But at the same time, there was this gratitude in knowing that I don't have to get back into nappies and the whole adolescence stage. And so there was yes, that gratitude. Yes. So I could now yeah. bring this awareness uh, and consciously into the world. And live it. I'm not, it didn't need to tell anyone. I didn't need to teach. I didn't need to write a book. I just needed to bring this consciousness into the projection and live it. Because by living it, since there's only one of us dreaming all eight, all, all nine trillion, all nine septillion beings, and there's only eight billion incarnated, but around the universe, there's many more. And of course, mm. in the spirit world, there's nine septillion beings. We're fractured into nine septillion and some change. Um, as I recognize it in my awareness, it's then shared with the collective whole. And that's why I always say that if you really want to serve mankind, 
you serve others through your own awakening. There's no one outside you to fix those of us that have the desire to help and heal others. What we see as others that need help was actually ourselves. And so mm. spirit beings that are programmed in the teacher role teach in order to remember themselves. So don't ever stop it because by helping others, you self-realize. But re recognize right up front, my helping others is my path to self-recognition, the self-awareness, the, the self-realization. Or as Maslow would put it, self-actualization, the realization I am that, which is the I am. Mm. Yeah, so dying is easy and beautiful. And in the case of yeah. people that die in traumatic experiences, car accident, eaten by a shark, the soul mm -hmm. aspect has no memory of that trauma because even moments before the car accident, the collision, the soul leaves the body. None of that trauma is carried through. Even people who have mm. the most traumatic lives, the minute they step through the tunnel, there's a cleansing immediately. It feels like you've cleansed through this jello bath. The only way I can explain it, there's no way to, to give it. It's not physical. There's this cleansing and the memory is just immediately released. And people that were your arch enemy in this world, you love them equally. Imagine the mm. person you love the most in this world. You love everyone in exactly the same way there. There's no one special. So you've had 12 ex-wives and you're wondering which one you're going to settle with when you get back up there. All 12 equally, but they may have 12 other partners too. So, you know, yeah, but there's no, there's none yeah. of that male female relationship in, in the spirit world because you don't, you're neither masculine nor feminine. You're a bit of both. You're neither nor mm. you have a resonance with one is a preference for either the masculine or the feminine in our incarnations. But let's say you start off incarnating in the feminine. At a certain stage, you want to play in the masculine, and then you'll start to transition. And that's where what we call homosexuality or the transgender movement is really souls that have incarnated in one sex for billions of lifetimes or hundreds of lifetimes now wanting to play in another sex. And so there's that, I don't want to use the word confusion, but there's no clarity in the role we should play. And so if you are always, if you've only incarnated in the feminine body and you've been attracted to, man, to men, if you incarnate now for the first time in a male body, you're still attracted to men. And, and that'll play out. And then eventually you'll get into the, you know, take no shit alpha masculine. And then you realize that doesn't work either. And eventually you'll settle as the sigma male or sigma female where you neither nor. You're just the recognition of yourself and the desire to pour all of it passionately into the world. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it more than does. And it's it's fascinating, Lewis, because you you've got to admit that like this is way out from what typical kind of discussion happens out there on an average day. So people are going to be hearing this being like, wow. But then I'm fascinated in the sense that, so you, you die, you go in back to the spirit world. Yeah. You come back. The experience is one of being inside a body bag again. I need to ask, like, did you climb out and what next? Yeah. So it's funny how life little things the script is so beautifully written. So, you know, in, in my, in the days of, um, the war, um, you play with body bags, you know, and, uh, and we play tricks on each other mm. and, we, and we jump into a body bag. And then when your friends walk past, you move and then they shit themselves and you just hope they don't pull a gun out and shoot you. But so I've been in a body bag before and you, you, there's a zip down the center. So you put your lip, your tongue out, you can touch the zip. So, okay. So my first moment, I try to move, but I was frozen. I've literally been there for four hours. Uh, I've been declared clinically dead and they wielded me into the, into the fridge and they just left me on one of those sort of steel trolley tables inside the morgue. They hadn't put me into a cabinet. The whole room was like this frozen room anyway. And so I tried to move my arms and my body and I couldn't because uh, not only that, I've been in a coma for many months. So muscle, muscle dystrophy and I couldn't move. 
I managed mm-hmm. to move my tongue out mm-hmm. and I realized there's a zip. So my first thought was, I hope they've zipped me from, you know, from foot to head, which means that the, the zip opening somewhere up here. And of course, in many years, in my martial arts life, we learn, we learn a technique of prana where you slow everything down and you extend and you either, you know, you create the St. Elmo's fire. You, you warm yourself up when you're cold or you cool your body down and you slow your heart rate down or you accelerate it. And I'd learned that in martial arts. Mm-hmm. Kendo. You know. And so I just put myself into prana state, warm myself up, and eventually I was able to in, in Aikido, we use energy. So no, you never close your hand. You open your hand and you move energy. Well, energy is your muscles flowing through. So I was able to find the zip and, and slowly unzip myself, you know. And you could breathe. And also, as I was breathing inside the body bag, it was warming me up because the breath is staying in there. And so I opened this, but, and I was expecting to see some sort of light, you know. Of course, it was, the room was pitch black because it's a big fridge. You know, I try to get all, I eventually sort of halfway out and I know I realized I was naked. So I tried to move and I wasn't quite was completely disorientated. I wasn't quite sure where I was. And um, eventually I moved and I fell off the I fell off this this trolley slab and That's hit the ground crazy. and that was a bit of a shock to the system and I could feel pain. And I remember mm. feeling such gratitude, like pain. I'm alive again. Wow. Gratitude yeah. and pain was a bizarre experience. Yeah. And as a young boy, I started working at a very young age because I wanted to buy a motorcycle. And of course, dad was completely anti motorcycle. So from the age of 12, I started working at friends' shops like cafes and butcheries. And, and I'd worked at a butchery for a short stint. I couldn't, I didn't last there very long because of the smell of dead meat. Anyway, but butcheries have these big fridges. And they have this, as you, I'm sure you've seen those big handles on the outside. And on the inside, they have this push rod type door handle. And those yes. door handles are made out of this phosphorus plastic. So they glow in the dark. And when I hit the ground and looked around, I saw this round phosphorus knob and I realized fridge, go there. That's the door. And I remember, you know, and I was freezing and the floor was ice cold. It was like this grano polished floor, ice cold. I was just thinking, don't get stuck to this floor. You know, don't get your private parts stuck to this floor. <laughs> so it, it felt like an yeah, hours. It probably took me a good half an hour to leopard crawl to this door. Mm. And then, of course, then was trying to get to the door handle, which in itself was impossible. But I managed to somehow lean up against the door and then probably took another hour with my butt freezing now. And managed to build enough energy in my body to reach out and hit the door handle. And that took several frustrating attempts. And eventually I heard click and then I just leant up against it as it slowly, slowly opened and just this tiny crack. And, and just beyond the door, there was this massive window and the sun was just at the right angle and it sort of shone in and I can feel this heat of the sun. And, um, I remember the first thought I had is if I start sizzling, then I died and I'm a vampire. So, I could feel this incredible heat. It's funny how the mind works. I was having, I was having this, this, I was happy. And eventually just sort of fell off naked into the corridor. And a few moments later or an hour later, I don't know, I must have passed out again. And all I heard was screaming. And it was this young nurse <laughs> walked past with a whole lot of Poor parts woman. the trolley. And she was going somewhere. And of course, she had to come past the morgue. And there I am, you know, she'd seen me a couple hours prior, you know, being declared dead and wheeled it into the morgue. And there I am lying half, (laughs) you know, the zombie apocalypse has just happened. And (laughs) she just screeched. And and then I just heard rushing feet and they picked me up and they wrapped a blanket around me and they took me back. She put me into a hot bath just to warm me up and they were rubbing me up and down. And I remember the conversations. And what was amazing at that moment is I could hear their thoughts clearly. Because I was still between this world where thought is just energy and you're aware of it, you know. And I remember the one doctor thinking, oh, my God, he's going to sue us for wrong diagnosis. <laughs> Find those sure. x-rays. Yeah. You know, what is he going to do anyway? And and then the horrified, you know, 
like, how are we going to tell his mother? We're going to have to phone his mother and tell her that the son we've just declared dead a couple of hours ago, he's alive. He's back. <laughs> so that was, a, you know, anyway, it was an experience. Subsequently to that, I mean, I found other people that have had a similar experience. There's a neurologist in the USA who's written a book, Proof of Heaven, mm -hmm. who had went through a very similar experience and his explanation of the spirit world, very similar to mine, not as detailed, but the experience, the existential experience of it, he explains in the same, we run out of words. But that wasn't enough for me. So, you know, I'm a strategist. I, I have an inquisitive <laughs> mind. So part of me said, what if I've just dreamt all of this up? And then, of course, as, mm. what happened, as a therapist for the next 10 years, I discovered just by chance regressional hypnotherapy. Well, I became, I was fully qualified hypnotherapist. But I had a young girl aged nine in my studio who was dying of leukemia. And in order to get rid of the pain, I asked her to go back to the time the leukemia started. And she stepped back into a life of, at the time of the pyramids, where she was a young slave girl and she was buried alive with the king of the time. And that's when she triggered the self-hatred and, 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 and fear-based self-hatred. And subsequently to that, every single life she's had, she's manifested leukemia. And she was giving this to me on the couch in total detail and then took me to the moment where she left her body, where she died, traveled back to the spirit world. And she explained the spirit world in the exact same way I had experienced it. Mm, wow. Oh, my goodness, I'm onto something. And then she explained mm. planning her next incarnation to the, in total detail. The entire script is written and she, she's chosen that body and then that and, that and so and so in every single lifetime subsequently to that. And eventually realized there was a formula to get out of this pattern. And if she found me in this lifetime, she would get out of it. Mm. And so if she scripted even our meeting and that triggered me. And so I then embarked on the, on the next 10 years of, I did over 3000 life between life and past life regressions and 3000 people under hypnosis from all walks of life and all varying beliefs, dogmas, religions, and atheists, under hypnosis, recalled the spirit world in exactly the same way. For me, life, you know, their previous lives wasn't interesting. Um, what I wanted to know was life in the spirit world, because I, of course, typically I would then start categorizing soul clusters, soul groups, soul stages, soul awakened stages, the, the nine angelic beings that we're privy to in the spirit world. Why some people die and imagine they're in hell until they get called out, said, hey, there's no hell, come back here. You know, no matter what they've done, no matter how terrible they've done, what they've done, there's no hell. You know, there's a sense of guilt and remorse for having done it, that's hell. And then they come back and, and very often then they take on the roles where they are the victims of the people they once were um, as a lesson. And so after 10 years, I had all this material in a school called Earth Was Born my first book where I categorized different soul stages and soul awakening stages and life in the spirit world and, and how we plan our lives in total detail. And so if you're suffering, you've chosen suffering because suffering will get you to a point where eventually you surrender to there must be another way and you, and you let go of all your beliefs, no matter what beliefs they are, all your beliefs in magic and all the different spiritual paths. And you realize, I need to be shown and you surrender to being shown and then it comes but the minute you go pursuing it in some way you lose it you, you can't find it you cannot we cannot get out of this puzzle we've created because we've made it with the same mind that's dreaming it up and so it's god's essence the essence of our source and in, in christian terms it's called the holy spirit which is actually the essence of what we are our holy spirit when we finally surrender to imagining what it should be and desiring it and just allow it to come and come. And then it's, and then you start to rec the recognition of one's own being until there's a full recognition of one, one's own being. And that recognition of one's own being is what we call enlightenment, the knowing of your essential nature. 
And that's why we're looping in, we're stuck in a reincarnation loop with billions of scripts written and and scripts are just records of what we've looked. You know, there's a lot of, there's a group of people that like to say the Akashic records. Well, no one's ever seen that. And um, I spent a considerable time in the spirit world, and we all have, but I have memory of it. And what we call the Akashic records are simply records of our lives. The script is written. So you cannot access future scripts because a future script is determined based on what you've achieved and learned in this lifetime. So if you fully awaken in this life, there's no more script. If you haven't, the script continues because it's miraculously written by the Christ mind, the awakened mind and the dream. So beings like Ramana Maharshi, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, um, and many others, Papa G, for example, um, Neem Karoli Baba, there's many of them, have fully awakened yeah. to Christ, in other words, awake mind. And that is the, and they no longer in singularity or physical form in the spirit world, unless you want to communicate, in which case the essence will present itself as if it's physical, because it's now part of the awake mind, which is you. Your, it's, the, it's your highest awake mind. Your highest self is the Christ mind, the anointed awake mind. And that is, and when you fully get it, this fractured of being, when you fully, when this fractured part fully understands itself, it dissolves and joins with that awakened mind. Well, what happens to you, the spirit being? You're no longer there. What happens to all the records of that spirit being no longer exists? You now move um, like yeah. the Jesus becomes a Christ into awake mind, Christ, and recognizes it's dreaming and also recognizes it's never left its source. It's still the extension of source energy. Source God, it's the extension of God's energy what is God's energy in our understanding? Love. And so Christ, mind, the dreamer, a part of the dreamer knows he's dreaming and has never left God. The rest of his fractures don't. Why can't he awaken the rest of his fractures? Free will. Just as he mm. chose to fall asleep and dream up the entire illusion, as the dreamer, I can't force my dream characters to awaken because if I do, they move into fear. And that is the reason why God doesn't step in and fix the world because the yeah. world is by our own making and God had nothing to do with the creation of this universe. He's created the sun. <laughs> one of the sons yeah. is us collectively. Yeah. And one of the sun fractures, one of the fractured parts of the sun in, in, in an incarnation 2000 years ago became Jesus awoke mm. and realized I and the father are one. And so did Buddha and Krishna and Ramana and Nim Karoli Baba, you know, um, they all perform miracles here. Why? Because they realize this isn't real. So the manifestation of energy we call miracle. You want to manifest food? Manifest. Water and earth is all illusion. So you want to walk on water? You walk on water. You know, I'm not there yet, but I understand the possibility of it. On your way, yeah. But so mm -hmm. do wish there's like you're used to this obviously right there's those leaning in which are like okay what lewis is saying is i mm. want to hear more it's touching something with me and there's those who are from this today running in the other direction because mm. you're crazy i'm crazy with you yeah. all good i want to i want to lean in here okay yeah. so this death experience returning understanding the spirit world you mentioned spirit beings mm -hmm. i've heard many a time and the saying of, you know, we aren't human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having this human experience. Mm -hmm. I'm inclined to say that's not entirely accurate in terms of the way you're describing spirit beings. And could you clarify that? So let's take the analogy of you go to bed tonight and you fall asleep on your bed. And in your, while you, and you fall asleep and you, you know, light sleep and then you go into deep sleep and then you go into REM sleep. REM is when we dream. And, and you find yourself in this world. And what are you in your dream? Are you physically in your dream? It, you feel like you are, your dream feels real to you, but you're a thought form, thought in form in the dream. And every other character in the dream is dreamt up by you, the dreamer. 
and there's good people and there's lovers and friends and enemies in your dream. You've dreamt them all up. They're all that you. Makes, yeah. They're all projections makes sense. You. If a character in your dream stood up and said, hey, Brian, wake up. This isn't real. What's wrong with you? You're mad. Run away. And one character stood up and called himself Lewis and tells you that you're dreaming. You go, come on, this is madness. You know, I believe mm. in God and his holy son and Jesus and died for my sins. And that's what you'd believe. But if a thousand characters in the dream shouted at you and said, Ryan, wake up, you're dreaming. You take those characters more seriously. Yeah, it might start listening. It's coming out of your deep sleep, the dream is still re recalled in your, in your mind. You're still replaying mm. the dream. Well, that's the state we're in. As a spirit world, the son, the son of God is awakening, and a part of him is awake, and a part of him is still recalling his dream. Why is he recalling his dream? Because of a sense of guilt. He hasn't forgiven himself for dreaming this up. Forgiveness mm. sets us free. And so, what is a spirit being? It's activities in the dreamer's mind, thoughts that have taken on form, spirit form. So, a spirit being is a thought form and at a certain stage of that spirit being's experience as an individual thought in form it then projected into the world of duality the universe the world of duality spirit world is not as physical as the universe it's still energy but not physical then projected the universe and it projected itself into the universe in terms of body minds it only projects about 10 percent of itself so your body mind is about 10% of your spirit being projected. The rest of it is still there watching the game as if you're in, playing a game. In, in the monotonous. spirit world. In the spirit world, you're still there residing as and an this is individual the... spirit being projecting a body mind called sure. Ryan. Okay. Yes. And so that part of you is very aware of what we're doing, which is why we feel guilty when we lie or cheat or whatever we do, because it's like you're playing Monopoly and that little piece on the monopoly board is just bought a hotel and every time someone lands on it you have to pay a fine and yet you know that you're not really that monopoly piece you're actually playing the game mm. and all of them playing the game is all you so that's why guilt is there because it's to remind us that there are no secrets in the dreamer's mind there just appears to be secrets in our physical manifestation i mean christ was aware of this and the enlightened beings always have what appears to be the psychic abilities of knowing what others are thinking, of the ability to heal. Why? Because you know it's all just energy. So a spirit mm. being is just a fractured part of our self. So when the son fell asleep, he split himself into two, masculine and feminine, then split himself into 12, 12 aspects, then into 144,000, then into 5.2 million, then in 8.2 trillion, and then into 9 septillion. So there was this fracturing of self until... He had fractured himself into nine septillion beings. These are just ideas of himself. And as each aspect of himself awakens, they recluster back up until there's only two essences and they wake up. And, and the minute the sun that has dreamt this entire dream wakes up, this entire universe disappears. And all that's left is the pure light of awareness. In short, what you're saying, this experience that we're having is a dream in the sleeping mind of the son of God. That's it. Well, son of God is a, I use the term because it's, I was raised in a Christian world. And so, you know, we were taught that God only has one son and that is absolutely true. Mm. He only has mm. one son. And we are collectively fractures of that sun. I understand. And one part of that sun woke up, and it's calling Jesus in the Christian world. And he awoke yes. into the realization what he was, and therefore death was no longer real, and therefore demonstrated resurrection. And because body mind isn't real, he then demonstrated ascension. He dissolved into nothingness, they ascended into, didn't ascend into heaven as if there's a heaven up there. Just literally dissolved from their awareness and then was immediately available to all minds. Mm. But what he teaches, and, the non-duality of Christian mysticism is no mm -hmm. different to the Upanishads of the, you know, Advita Vedanta or 
the Bhagavad Gita or the Egyptian Book of the Dead or the I Ching, they're all, Taoism is all teaching the same essence as what Jesus taught, which was I and my Father are one, non-duality, I am that I am, yeah. the I and me is the I and all of us. Yes. And if all of these fractured selves woke up, would or universe. the dreamer, the dreamer would then wake up from the dream and realizes he's never left. He, the dream was the journey. The prodigal son went to look mm. for himself, find himself in the world. And he awakens and the father says, let's throw the feast. My son is home. And it's not that the son returns home. He's never left. He just awakens to the reality. He's never left. Yeah. He, he dreamt. He, he thought he had left. That's it. And therefore, yeah. The only way to this awakening is to take full responsibility that you, the real you, the real essence of what you are, the I am, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that which created all of this and now is experiencing itself from a split off point of view called me. Yeah, we're a little bit more crazy than we were 10 minutes ago, <laughs> but I'm, I'm learning from you. So you, you say often in just your languaging that the script is written. There's a lot more to that than just the, what the script is written is saying, Luish. So give us a little bit more, please. So the script is written in essence means the sun fell asleep and the sun woke up and realized even mm -hmm. the reason the universe appears to continue is because a part of his, his mind is trapped still in guilt because he is manifest to this entire universe and all the atrocities that go with it. And there's a, there's a, he hasn't fully forgiven himself in what appears to be space and time. I mean, space is really the sun's perception of here. And time is really his perception of now, now here, nowhere. Um, but he's awakening to the reality. It's all him self as that, which is the sun. And the sun is really the extension of source energy. So the extension, we are the love of God. And we are, if the love of God is God's kingdom, we are the kingdom. So what we call the heart, which is the awakened part of the mind in each fractured being, projected into form or spirit, the, the memory of our true self, our holy memory, our holy spirit memory of our true self retains the memory. So when you say the word holy spirit, you actually mean memory of God in us. And we're returning to that awakened memory where the illusion of what we call the world of reality is dissolving. And a new world comes in its place. And what is a new world? It's a new way of seeing it. So what's really changing is that although the script is written, and since the total script is written, our, our every single individual life is scripted already. So the day you're born and the day that you die is scripted. But if you start awakening in between that space time, what happens is you'll go through the rest of the motions just your reaction to it will no longer be hurtful or negative. You won't see yourself as a victim of the world, but that who is responsible for having created all your experiences. So suffering dissolves in the light of awareness. And since your script is written, your future experiences become lovingly accepted. So you accept what is no resistance to what is. And, you move into a state of conscious, conscious gratitude for being. And every experience then becomes an experience of gratitude for experience itself without any attachment to anything or to any outcome. And yet the divine realization that you are connected to all of it. Mm. So none. It's no longer detaching because one of the biggest mistakes we do as we awakening through our spiritual lives is, we want to detach, run away from the world, become reclusive, close off. You can't detach because it's all you. You need to love it, but you must not be attached to any of the outcome. 
And so the script is written means that you're going to be born and you're going to die and appear to travel through time, but you're not really traveling through time. You just appear to be. You're always here now. And there's nowhere to go because it's always now here. Um, and so the script is written means it's all played out it's, and you're playing it out and you, you can't change it because it's scripted. What you can change is the way you experience it, which is why I often teach. Don't want, don't try and be, you want to be the famous, I like to use Elon Musk, Elon Musk. A fractured part of yourself is Elon Musk. A fractured part of yourself is you. And this you plays out this role, and Elon Musk plays out his role. The minute you try and be him, you can't, and it'll just frustrate you, and you become unhappy because you want to be, you want to be what you perceive Elon to be, which is happy billionaire. What you don't realize is he's going through exactly the same challenges as you are. All eight billion of us are going through exactly mm. the same challenges. Just the characters in our plays are different. The environment, the backdrops are different. Names, people, places, things, and events appear to be different, but the lessons are always the same fundamental lessons, which is we've fallen asleep, and so we awaken in the dream. Whoops, okay, where am I? Lost. The idea of fear enters. So fear, we're all trying to overcome fear. The fear says, oh my gosh, something happened. And therefore, I've been abandoned. Sense of abandonment. If I've been abandoned, it's because I wasn't good enough. And therefore, I was rejected. Fear, abandonment, unworthiness, rejection. And then that loops into the way to overcome this is to become something important, to appease whatever's, whatever I imagine has created me, not realizing I haven't met. And then the identification with that role. And every single one of us is playing out those five lessons. Abandonment, rejection, unworthiness, you know, all grounded in fear. And then we try and play a role to overcome it. Mm. And yet, so you're, Ryan is playing Ryan and Lou's playing Lou, but it's all I am. And that I am, the I am in you, which is simple. Another way to explain it is, the observer in you and the observer in me is not two different observers. It's not our spirit being observing. It's the dreamer who's dreamt up the spirit beings, observing both the spirit being and its physical projection. It's observing all of it. And so it doesn't judge. Mm. The judgment's happening by the spirit being who has projected into physical form a tiny mad idea crept into that physical form where it believed in scarcity because of fear. It believed in the possibility of sin, fear, and guilt. And that's what traps us in the, in the routine of trying to escape. And if you look at what, what is everybody trying to do, everybody's trying to become eternally happy, permanently happy. And so we pursue happiness through people, places, things, and events. Believing that if we acquire people, places, things, and events, we will be happy. But you can't acquire illusion because you are that which is happiness itself. So it's the relinquishment of the desire to acquire. And it's not desire, but the natural essence of wanting to be that which we are, which is the way out. How does it play out in this world, in the world of business? It's the, the natural tendency we have to passionately play out our essential nature. And in this world, we call essential nature, talent, passion. Mm. So through our path, inherently designed into us as our passionate nature, is our path to remembering the self. Because our path is littered with obstacles every path. And if you change path, the obstacles just shift. So if you move to Australia, the obstacles just trans, you know, yes. just, they just move to Australia with you. They translocate to Australia and it may appear as, you know, in this path, it might be a lion. And in that path, it's a um, group of crazy drug induced kangaroos. 
They're both going to rip you apart. Okay? So the path is built in. So you may change the view, but the path remains the path because the path is being projected from within you. And so sure. when you pursue your passionate nature without resisting what is and without the desire to be something you're not, you align. True alignment is not spirit, body, mind alignment. That is one of the biggest spiritual lies ever told. There's no such thing as spirit, body, mind alignment. You are pure mind, temporarily projecting as body, mind. Okay, and what we call pure mind is actually spirit. Pure spirit, mm. temporarily projected as body, mind. You want to align, you, you let go of the idea that you're a body with a mind, and you align with spirit, heart, self, love. And everything aligns. So what we call balance in this world is really just the activities of making sure you're not obsessively doing something too much and, and finding a balance between play time, study time, quiet time, doing, being. But there's nothing we can physically do. No form of meditation, no form of yoga, no form of mantra that can awaken us. All that, that you know, modalities like meditation, and mantra, all it does is it brings you into the silent stillness of self where the memory is revealed in the perfect silence. It's the wonderful term in the Bible, be still and know I am. In the stillness, you'll know the I am. Full stop, then the word God. It's not be still and know I am God because you're not God, you're an extension of. Mm. An extension of is not its source. There's source first and foremost in the extension there are. A lot of spiritual people like to say, oh, I am God. You're not. Yeah. You're an extension of, you are the love of God. One with mm. God, yes. There's no distinction. There's no division. There's no border between you and God. But you are not that. As the Father creates, so the Son creates like the Father. But the Son cannot create the Father. I don't know if that's making sense. <laughs> it's making sense. Mind and make sense of it. Yeah, so if somebody is hearing this, Lewish, and feeling to themselves that they want to explore what you've e expressed today and mentioned today, you've written another book, right? How can people get hold of your book? Do you want to touch on A Course in Miracles? Because you're using terminology which isn't necessarily familiar terminology to to most. Sure. So I teach... Um... I do teach from the book A Course in Miracles every Wednesday night on Zoom, and it's free. I don't charge for my work. And um, I, I've written another book called A School Called The Universe, and A School Called The Universe is available on Amazon, either on ebook or on soft cover. So you can just, if you want to understand all of this, in the new book I explain the mechanics and the dynamics of the falling asleep and how the dream world, spirit world, secret dream was created. And then how we got stuck there and we couldn't figure out what we were because there was no, no real duality, no deep duality in, in the spirit world. And so we then projected the universe as a dualistic space-time matter continuum in order to experience duality. And through duality, um, we realize what we are through the experience of what we're not. So the school called the universe gives not only the understanding of of the, the mechanics of the dream, it then also gives a recommendation based on my own path to self-realization on how one, one, it's one possibility of figuring it out. And it's a possibility that says, don't give up your day job. Don't quit this world and move into an ashram and, 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 Come all day long. That's not necessary. You are uniquely designed, and in your design, you will awaken. Follow your passion, follow your bliss, follow your joy. In other words, what you love to do. And in doing what you love to do, your realization will come if you stay vigilant, conscious, and spend a bit of time in contemplation, meditation, prayer. It will be revealed to you. And you don't have to give up anything. You don't have to give up your job, sell your house, get rid of your car. You can still live a joyous physical abundance in this world, but it's no longer your God. 
It's just an extension and expression of you as opposed to a desire to acquire in order to be something because you'll realize you are everything. What a perfect, perfect way to wrap up. Do what you love. Lewis, thank you for an incredible conversation. Thank you for choosing to be here now together. And I look forward to many more conversations like this together. Thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. And I hope this brings clarity to many minds. Thank you, Lewis.